wondering why it was in effect in the U.S. more, by the way. Why is it the U.S. in on some of the, uh, shall we say, sheltering of refugees in this regard? Uh, no one seems to bring that up very much. Uh, and that's been probably a historical, uh, historically we've seen that as well. Refugees from the Holocaust, refugees from past conflicts in Southeast Asia, refugees from Cuba, refugees from Central America. They've come at times, but often not fully welcomed and not fully uh, uh, coordinated by government policy. Because there tends to be a resistance and a misunderstanding. Even the terms that are used today in Europe, uh, migrants versus refugees. Governments want to talk about migrants, which seemingly takes it down a couple of notches from the, you know, its, real, its real impact, which is that these people are desperate and they're fleeing violence and their lives are in danger back home. My, migrants can be turned away. Refugees under international law should not be turned away. We've, we've heard reports about that on, on the radio and so forth, that refuge, if it's called a refugee situation, there are lots of there's lots of machinery that's engaged, including legal machinery, on their behalf. So uh, we very well know about Freedom House in downtown Detroit, which has for years in a harbor, a beacon of um, hope for people fleeing in desperation. And they've had their odds and ends with difficulties dealing with the authorities at times and with the Border Patrol and all and so forth and the rear roll of people getting resettled. But they hold forth and they continue and we send a lot of students there as learning experiences in the center. Now in today's peacemaking globally, there are three challenges that I would know. And we, we talk about the issues of peace globally, and it is coming to be International Peace Day, so it's kind of uh, appropriate. We can talk about peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building. This is the trichotomy that we often are talking about in uh, peace and conflict studies. Uh, the peacemaking is the challenge of stopping the violence initially. And that's, you know, hopefully ending the skewing of refugees, or at least, you know, slowing it by, by controlling and getting under control of violent situations. Peacekeeping is once you establish a ceasefire, how do you keep it? How do you maintain it? How do you, uh, you know, uh, enforce it, so to speak? But finally, the biggest challenge of all is the third challenge, and that's peace building. How do, you make, how do you get under the surface issues? How do you get under the dispute to the conflict and resolve it and create conditions where it's not likely to recur? And then you have the question of what's peace? Peace with justice is a term we often are, uh, con and are conscious of in our community, in our peace community, but not everybody thinks in those terms. Some people stop for just Stopping the violence. But justice questions, questions of equity, questions of resolving past injustices are some of the fundamental points at which you can stop the recurrence of the violence. Well, let's look at it in turn. In the peacemaking domain, stopping the violence issues themselves, we are confronting an ever more complicated world situation today. <coughs> because the war makers, so to speak, have concocted new and intriguing strategies uh, that uh, challenge the question of can you stop the violence? And how do you stop the violence? Uh, people have noted early on in the 90s, they came up with the notion of new war. This is Mary Caldor, a British scholar, uh, observing at that time in the 1990s the uh, tragedies of Bosnia and the victimization of civilians. The primary targets and victims of today's wars are no longer just on the battlefields. They're no longer just pitched battles. I think there was just a replay of the Civil War, uh, classic Ken Burns saga the other night and the last few nights on public TV. And of course, those were a series of pitched battles. Very tragic, they're extremely bloody. The amount of death 
during the Civil War. But it was largely, not, well, not totally, not largely confined to battlefield casualties, over 700,000, the biggest set of casualties in American history in the war. But of course, there were civilian victims as well in the marches through cities, in the blockades of ports, in the starvation, uh, in the spread of disease. Uh, there, are, there were uh, lots of civilian victims as well. But what Calvary noted is that today's wars are seemingly the, the new brand. And it's not entirely new, nothing's quite new under the sun. But the new brand, so to speak, is targeting civilians, as in Sarajevo where shelling took place at the main targets of civilian and cultural life to drive people out, to force people to flee, to take over their territories. Ethnic cleansing became a term we, we, we became, you know, rem reminiscing about the uh, previous era of the Holocaust. Uh, and so uh, that, that targeting of civilians, the, the, the main victims being Civilians, the, the, the generation of human trafficking out of wars. The, uh, the question of people, uh, you know, forming these desperate refugee situations uh, became ever more ominous in the new war. Now, since the new war was defined in 1990, we've had the 2001 anniversary, of Friday, of something called asymmetric war. Asymmetric which is that the warring parties are unequal in power, vastly unequal in power. And it's often the insurgent groups, the, the resistant fighters who will not give in but are non-governmental actors, non-state actors, who are fighting states. And here we get the Al-Qaeda phenomenon and the counter war strategies, the war, quote unquote, war on terror, which is always a, 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 a non sequitur to me, because how do you ever end the war on terror? When do you ever stop terror? And how do you stop, quote unquote, terror? Uh, and the targeting of the Taliban, and the years of warfare spent with a major power, with the largest military in the world, trying to defeat a non-state actor in an asymmetric war situation. We, we saw some of this in Vietnam, but even in Vietnam there was uh, a little bit more symmetry than there turned out to be in the uh, end ideas. That's why it's so difficult to win such asymmetric wars. It's usually the military being called upon to eradicate an idea in the case of the Viet Cong, to win hearts and minds through military tactics became an absurdity. And they, that sort of was revived in Afghanistan uh, in a very similar kind of situation. Uh, efforts to discredit and defeat the popularity, or the, at least the acceptance, of a group like the Taliban. And I'll get to how, you know, why that's difficult in a bit, but these, this is the essence of asymmetric war. That you're fighting unequals, but they don't give up. And they can cause havoc by tactics like guerrilla, ta guerrilla tactics and terror tactics and uh, remote, remote attacks and you know, bombings and suicide attacks. All right, so you have that situation and the response of the national security uh, uh, apparatus attempting to deal with that. And now, with the 2010, 12, and 15 situation, we have another, another new variant. It's come to be called hybrid war. Hybrid war. And what is that? Well, that's when the Russians wear masks and don't appear in uniforms and go across the border and make relationships with, with militias in East Ukraine. And you're not quite admitting that there's a war going on. You're not quite admitting you're fighting it. But everyone seems to know that you're involved in doing that, and for whatever reason. Uh, but the question is, do you, is that the militias 
government doing it, and the government doesn't even admit to being there, and it, you know, you, you, this has been coming on for a while too, as governments have made use of militias in very, excuse the expression, malicious ways. And on the other side of the Ukraine situation, by the way, the militias are not uh, pure of heart either. Some very ugly nationalistic traditions have been revived in the western part of Ukraine, with militias fighting off those in the east, almost like motorcycle gangs. And they have their governmental patrons. So what is that? It's, it's sort of asymmetric, but it's not quite asymmetric. It's sort of a new war. It's not quite to the fullest degree, but they've come to call it a hybrid war because it involves governments, but not officially. It involves militias, and can you really trace it? And it's, as you can see, these new forms create great challenges for settlement. Look at Syria, where we have a very, very entrenched uh, civil war situation. You know, we had our own civil war for four years, very entrenched, very deadly, with outside potential interveners and all kinds of uh, complications and the question of, you know, of, uh, who's, who, uh, who, who has the right to do what they do? Uh, can you have secession or can you not? Is slavery allowed to be allowed or not? To be tolerated if the unions put back together or not? All of these complicated questions in our own civil war. Uh, the Syrian civil war is very brutal. And it runs into international law questions where you're, the, the, the bias in international law is against the rebels and for the governments. So the question is, can you aid rebels in a civil war? And generally the answer is no, unless the order is completely broken down. And you have then complicating factors like the use of poison gas, maybe on more, more than one side, and barrel bombs, Civilian, uh, uh, aimed supposedly at military targets, but victimizing mostly civilians. And uh, extremists. Extremists who want to do away with all the boundaries of these countries and create a new structure called the Islamic State, perhaps, across the boundaries of the Iraq and Syria, boundaries that were drawn by colonial powers, boundaries that unified or attempted to unify very uh, ethnic and cultural groups that don't quite cohere, and very complicated warfare to stop. Now the UN represents, in a way, a last best hope in this regard, and it gets us to the question of peacemaking and peacekeeping. How do you stop a, a, uh, an asymmetric or hybrid war situation that is uh, ongoing? and has been fueled by outside monies and power. Uh, ideally, you understand that these situations have roots at the local level, the regional level, and the global. All of these situations, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Syria, whether it's the China Seas, which could explode into a more conventional kind of warfare, where China claims Islands, great challenges to uh, peacemaking these days. Uh, all of them are rooted in both local conditions, regional rivalries, and global balances, so to speak. Global competition between big powers. And to get at the solutions, it would appear requires uh, methods at all three levels. It is not sufficient to aid rebels that are so-called moderates. Not even probably feasible to do that, but the U.S. seems to adopt that approach because politically, we're unable to accept Assad, and politically, we're even more unable to accept ISIS. So we look for a convenient, possible, face-saving something to do, and it doesn't look like it's a very uh, meaningful possibility to find moderates that you can then have fighting off these two sides. Uh, in reality, it probably is the case now that the U.S. is collaborating more with Assad than we are 
the others in the, in, in the territory because of the fear of ISIS. And then you have U.S. allies like the Turks. As you go regional, you go from the local, the split of Syria itself, to the regional, and the question of Iran and Turkey and their roles, if you're placating or stimulating the conflicts. And you see that they all play for their own interests as well. Turkey does attack ISIS, you know, somewhat reluctantly, I think, at U.S. encouragement. But they then go to war with the Kurds, the ethnic minority that they fear. And their real target probably is Assad, because the Turks do not, at least the Turkish government, does not want Assad to stay in power. So how can you play all three sides of it like this at the same time? And then how do you make peace with that? And then you have the U.S. and the Russians and the Chinese at the Security Council trying to perhaps come to terms with what do you do about any of this? Can you do anything? They could, if they agreed, uh, enforce or attempt to enforce a peace, a peace accord, at least a uh, ceasefire in the Syrian case. Uh, but they don't agree. And the UN is structured that if you don't have agreement among the major powers, you don't act. Because the League of Nations fell apart for these disagreements. So, negotiation, we think, is the ultimate necessity in bringing such conflicts to a halt. Uh, that means that although civil wars often end with military victories and the Assad regime is probably banking on its long-term potential for outlasting its opponents. If it realizes that it is not going to regain the territory held by ISIS and others, presumably there become grounds for some sort of negotiation to end the warfare at some point. Because you run out of soldiers. You run out of money. You run out of legitimacy if you can't control the territory. But you have friends. You have the regional friends like Iran, which backs Assad's regime. But then the US and Iran are in another set of negotiations over something else. So one conflict affects another. The Russians do not want uh, much to be done about Syria, but they do help with the poison gas issue, with the chemical weapons issue, with the nuclear issue in Iran, as long as you can leave them alone about Ukraine. So you have these rivalries and these complications, but I think that this, the future of Iraq and the future of Syria will have to be solved in a regional set of negotiations, which would include the parties themselves. That means you have this difficulty of taking into negotiations these non-state actors. How do you actually negotiate with ISIS? Can you negotiate with ISIS? Should you? Are their tactics too outrageous? Is their cause, whatever their cause may have some justice behind it, but are their tactics too outrageous? Well, you negotiate some prisoner swaps sometimes. You negotiate some hostage money sometimes with them. At least the Europeans have. So, to what extent can that be extended to general negotiations? Which would be the regional parties, including the Saudis in this case, in the Syrian case, because they have a severe interest in ousting Assad and weakening Iran. But it's a question as to how far they would go in doing that with ISIS. But they're an American colleague at the same time. And you have the Iranians and the Turks and the, obviously the Israelis have something to say, but I'm not sure they would be in the negotiations. Uh, and the Jordanians and the Lebanese and so forth, who are implicated by all of what goes on in Syria. And it is a very dire implication. Because these states will implode if nothing is done. And maybe that's just another. But if you're looking at the peacemaking, You'd like to think you could stop short of the implosion and all the chaos it would cause throughout the Middle 
Um, so you have these challenges, but I think then that there would have to be the superpower, the major powers, the regional powers, and the local actors all somehow engaged in a set of negotiations to say, can we set some boundaries and say we can stop the shooting, at least for the initial period. Once you do that, of course, it becomes a question of peacekeeping. Now, we know there are about 187,000 UN peacekeeping forces around the world. How many? About 187,000 troops have been counted as UN peacekeeping forces. The only problem with that is that they're not permanent forces under UN authority. They're hit and miss. They're accumulated by, by the crisis situation and who's willing to contribute troops. Many of these have served in Africa, in the African Civil Wars, and so forth. Uh, and they come up with the idea of what they call robust peacekeeping, which is going beyond simply separating the, the parties and keeping them apart, which used to be what, what peacekeeping was about, was keeping them apart, to actually enforcing peace when someone breaks a ceasefire, to actually shooting people. And the more an international military contingent takes part in the war, the harder it is, the more controversial it is for their country to continue allocating those orders. You know, peacekeeping forces traditionally have come from countries like Canada, Sweden, India, uh, some of the more trusted non-aligned actors or non-great powers. But those troops, when they're in danger, Nigeria has provided a lot of peacekeeping troops. When they're in danger, the question becomes, can they continue? Or will they be withdrawn? And in addition, of course, we find some of the peacekeepers at times have done egregious things themselves. Canadians find it hard to get over having sat by and watched Srebrenica take place, the killings in, in Bosnia and Srebrenica without having done anything because they were not ordered to, to uh, fight to save those people in that, in that what was supposed to be a refuge. Uh, and they've had, they've had a great deal of guilt about that in Canada. And, and you've had the Nigerians at times looting and doing outrageous things in some of the countries that they've served. Which in a sense gets us to our third question, which is about peace building. And one of the key detriments to being able to solve crises in the world and find reconciliation and actual solution it is something that's been pointed out in an interesting new book about corruption. To set the conditions for a lasting peace, you have to have a viable governmental authority that does not victimize people, that actually begins to share power, with minorities or even majorities. In the case of Syria, it's run by a minority ethnic community, and it leads to ideally enlarge to meaningful power sharing with the majority if Syria is to be a viable state in the future. The same with Iraq. Iraq, run by now a majority regime of the Shia uh, community, but victimized the Sunnis because of past reverse discrimination that took place and left them out of the equations of power sharing. Kurds were included, the Sunnis by and large were not. And it's in that inequality, in that sense of alienation, in that sense of being cheated and oppressed that people rebel and continue to rebel. So to get regimes to actually open up to their countrymen and clean up. And the book I'm referring to is a book about a book called The Thieves of State by Sarah Chase. Sarah Chase is a US diplomat. His father was a professor. Her father was a professor. Uh, who noted that in almost every effort the US makes to fight asymmetric wars, so to speak, 
The problem of endemic corruption makes it almost impossible to succeed. And in most of the developing world, as we call it, and in some of the developed world, the regimes are corrupt. Both the Russian and Ukraine regimes are noted for corruption. I mean, we have our own issues of corruption in this country, but it's quite, at least there are some ways to address corruption here through time that have not been adopted in other places. And it is the case in Afghanistan that the Afghan government that we back and still back with a different leader, is just, just riddled with corruption, of people on the take, of people not serving the communities they're supposed to be governing, of cronyism, and cheating. And people are aware of this. The masses of publics are aware of this. They're fully aware. Sometimes they have no choice but to comply. Mexico has been notable for corruption for years, which makes you know the government there uh, unable to fully maintain a work because of the, you know, the temptation to be bribed, frankly, by, by criminal elements and the alienation of rural elements. Who are, who are victimized. Uh, and so this kind of endemic corruption, which is around the world, complicates the question, how do you rebuild from the war? How do you create conditions where people are able to live with security and some income? But beyond that, where they're included in governing and power sharing in a meaningful way, not just a surface way. The Lebanese have a way of parceling out government, you know, jobs to different ethnic groups. But it's never worked to keep the peace because it is corrupt. And Che's book, I think, makes a very good uh, point that U.S. policy needs to be much more directed toward stopping corruption than stopping insurgency. Because the two go hand in hand. Um, so, you know, this had, there are questions of discriminatory laws, for instance, in countries, where the, uh, those in power take the opportunity to victimize those who are out of power. I'm astounded at the statements of the Slovak, Slovakian government, I believe, in recent days, that they will take refugees coming from the Middle East as long as they're Christian. So what we're doing is clear. We're playing into the human fears of each other, the human uh, uh, rejection of outsiders, of outside groups. Uh, this morning on the news, I heard uh, presidential candidates in this country talking about how Muslims should not uh, ever uh, establish their laws because this is a secular society, but it's okay for Christians to establish law. Yeah. Christian law. So these kinds of double standards, these kinds of clearly, you'd have to say racist, you'd have to say uh, <laughs> culturally victimizing approaches, and often out of fear and, and insecurity, but played out in prejudice and bias, are underneath. They come out again from past times when turmoil occurs, when disruption occurs. We thought we had a peaceful Yugoslavia back in 1990 when the spirit of Sarajevo at the Olympics was so wonderful and people were living together. The part of Yugoslav, former Yugoslavia that was most cosmopolitan most peace-loving, most intercultural, was blown up by the rejectionists who could not tolerate such policies of cohab cohabitation and intermixing, who took, tried to take advantage of ch chances to grab other people's territory, other people's uh, properties and houses and so forth. Um, 
It's been pointed out that in this country we tolerated the internment of the Japanese Americans. We, uh, we have candidates seriously talking about rejuvenating the policy from the 1930s, which was the expulsion of Mexicans and Lat Lat Latinos. That actually happened. I learned a little bit about it this morning, listening. Uh, the expulsion, the, uh, what was it called? Repatriation of Mexican families from this country in the 1930s. Both the Hoover and Roosevelt administrations allowed it to happen. And American citizens getting uh, deported to, to Mexico because of economic hardships that people were feeling. But we had these kinds of sentiments back and actually being proposed by a semi-serious presidential candidate. <laughs> we have to watch this. We have to watch some of our <coughs> angels of worse nature, maybe, to change Abraham Lincoln's uh, way of describing things instead of our better nature. The angels of our worse nature. Uh, reviving these kinds of prejudices and playing on them in political campaigns. I mean, people were amused, are amused to some extent by Donald Trump. He's kind of a phenomenon, and kind of people like to watch and be entertained. But he could have said the same thing about Hitler as he rose to power and was elected in 1932. Not, didn't have a takeover, he was elected. You have to watch electoral appeal of these kinds of bashings, these kinds of appeals to our worst nature. And it's present still in Europe, it's present in the Middle East, it's present in North Africa, and unfortunately it's present in the Americas. So these are challenges. I wish I could give us easy answers. We have some encouragement. I would note the achievement of the Iran nuclear agreement as a peacemaking potential, despite what the criticism says. One of the most far-reaching agreements. By the way, it's not entirely equitable, because other countries that have nuclear weapons are not being asked also to disarm them in any significant ways, particularly countries in the region. Pakistan, Israel, so forth. But we do have at least some coming to terms of countries that we're really not dealing with each other artificially for 30 years in the United States and Iran. Now, some of this is driven by, you know, plain old political interest. Iran is helping the United States hunt down and chase down ISIS. We don't admit that. But in Iraq, where the army is not reliable, it's the Iranians who, to a large degree, limited the, uh, what looked like a potential takeover of the whole country. Now, maybe that shouldn't be the American interest. Who are we to say what Iraq should ultimately look like? But when we're in this game, we realize that there are parties that are potential collaborators. And I think that has helped drive what we sometimes term rapprochement to a certain extent, with Iran. Again, not being fully admitted on either side because it's politically unpopular. But we have the first tentative steps toward perhaps regularizing relationships with Iran. That would help in the Middle East if there were a set of understandings. Everybody's worried the thing will wear off in 10, 15 years, the agreement will end. Well, in 10, 15 years, anything can happen. You could actually be on better terms in 10, 15 years. <laughs> not so concerned, and the Iranians not so desperate to avoid being overthrown by outsiders, then you would ease the necessity of having nuclear weapons, generally. So it is an achievement. It's an achievement of a difficult set of negotiations over a long period of time. I think for, we might say that President Obama ends his term trying to deserve the Nobel Peace Prize he got at the beginning of his term. Because he was the first to raise, re-raise the consciousness about nuclear weapons again. That they were spreading, that they had a potential danger of spreading. Uh, we have led our nuclear agreements with, 
Russians and others laughs very, very dangerously, by the way. No one's paying much attention to them. And a lot of spending is going into revamping nuclear weapons. Uh, so raising the agenda item again and making people aware of it is not a bad thing. Uh, and we have some hope that this kind of agreement sets the stage for other agreements to follow. But that's the way. Negotiation is the only, I think, viable way to, to deal with asymmetric, new, and hybrid wars. You have to recognize the realities of who is actually involved. In the Ukraine situation, you will not have an agreement there that does not involve Russian uh, participation in the EU. Because look where it is. It's their version of Cuba. And the Cuban Missile Crisis showed very clearly that the U.S. Uh, confronted the Russians. The Russians are confronting the West in Ukraine in their own way. So anything we can do to ameliorate and and, and I, I think the Obama administration is trying a tactic there because it's not going to be a military confrontation. It's going to be a tactic of, of sanctions to see if they can help bring the Russians to the table in a meaningful way to get that situation resolved. And when it does get steps do, are taken, of course, protests occur in the other part of Ukraine, as we've seen. National, ultra-nationalists don't want there to be autonomy in the eastern part of Ukraine. So these are complicated local, regional, and global issues that have to have these kinds of, I think, summit meetings to set the stage for some actual peacemaking hopefully then leading to some ways of controlling that for peacekeeping, and finally to establishing some better situations of less corruption, less victimization, more power sharing, and uh, less discriminatory laws, fewer discriminatory laws that make peace building possible. So with that, I'd like to open to your questions and we'll see where you stand on some of those. Of the responsibility to protect. What does that mean? 
means that starting in, well, starting in the Holocaust, and maybe even earlier, people stood by and watched whole populations decimated and destroyed in genocides and uh, ethnic, ethnic cleansing. The world witnessing that somehow came to guilt, particularly after Bosnia. And we began to see in the United Nations an assertion I think it came under the Kofi Annan, General uh, Kofi Annan uh, uh, leadership, that you can't just sit by and watch people decimated by their own governments. You must do something, the responsibility to protect. Now that doesn't mean you have to go to war necessarily. You may accept refugees. You may send humanitarian assistance. You may uh, intervene diplomatically. You may do sanctions. You may, but you must do something and not just let it happen. And Assad had a, you know, a reality. The whole family regime has had a reality of uh, victimizing their uh, dissident populations, claiming that they were rebels. Governments always use the term they're rebels, they're terrorists, they're this and they're that. And so I have, we have a right to put them down. Well, it begins to be a general global norm. You can't just say that, you can't just get away with it. The problem is, what are you going to do about it? And, and I think Secretary of State Clinton ran into this dilemma when she was in office, when the Arab Spring occurred, when you had a series of countries, in a series of countries, the, the young people and the people out of power challenging these oppressive 40-year-old dictatorships in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Yemen, and on around even to the Gulf states. And Hillary Clinton warned some of these Gulf rulers, the men who happened to be leaders, that they were out of touch with history. You better get with it, she said, because the internet is on, and young people are arrested, and they're not going to put up with this kind of repressive, uh, dictatorial rule. The only problem was the U.S. was hypocritical about what we did about it. We tolerated it quite well when it was in North Africa and the Tunisians freed them, so-called freed themselves. And a little more trouble though with our own, with our own erstwhile ally, Mr. Mubarak, in Egypt, letting him go down. We tentatively, you know, tentatively had to be on the side of the protesters. But then again, look what happened. You had an election. People reverted to their ethnic kin, kinship interests to elect a ruling party, happened to be an Islamic, Islamist party. Some people got victimized, Coptic Christians, for instance, and others who had already been victimized but continued to be. And finally, the army got back and, re and retook it. So now it's again a military state. And the U.S. didn't object a fundamentally to that set of events. But when you got to Yemen, and then you got further to the Gulf, the U.S. had no sympathy for the rebellions. And in fact, watched Saudi troops go into Bahrain and shoot at young people in the streets to get that, that stopped. Because Bahrain has a Shia majority, ruled by a Sunni uh, Monarchy and the Saudis are in desperate competition with Iran and won't let an oil state go. And the U.S. happens to have the Navy, the main naval base. Mm -hmm. So this kind of reality check and hypocrisy. And then we came back uh, a little later and helped depose Mr. Gaddafi. And what was the result of that? Well. Yeah. Come back to haunt Hillary Clinton in a big way, a place called Benghazi. And it further haunted North Africa as the arms from his, from Gaddafi's uh, armories spread throughout the region and you had more and more rebellion by more and more Islamist uh, movements, then put down by the French and others. So the question is when you do these kinds of moves and you try to intervene on behalf of responsibility to protect, 
supposedly. In each case, we said, these governments are about to harm their own peoples. They're either shooting at them, or they're assuming that we'll be shooting at them, and in Assad's case, they have done it in the past, so we want to get rid of them. But I think the Obama people finally learn when you get rid of the governments, you don't know what's coming next. So I think we've reverted to allowing and allowing for governmental survival because we're worried about, this country's worried about the, who, 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 do you, who will, who will uh, inherit? What do we know about any of these groups? Who will inherit and what will they do? So I think it's an interesting, it's a very important question, where do we get this bias against rebels? But I think right now we're in, in a way back to it because the rebels have been seemingly quite extreme in many of these instances. Dilemma. 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 Yes. What effect will renewable fuels uh, have on the whole thing? Yes, well, you know, the people have said for years the Middle East will cease to be so strategic when oil ceases to be the main fuel. And the question is, what will renewable fuel mean for any of this? It will probably lessen the outside global interests. The Chinese have some very strong interests in, in, uh, in oil fuel. But the more the world can, re can, can revert to renewable fuels, you have less political peddling of influence going on either by corporations or by governments to be, become militarily involved in the region to secure those resources. And the Middle East has, in a way, it's suffered, actually. Some interesting recent thoughts about the Syrian conflict. I saw one report that it's global climate change that has exacerbated part of the Syrian civil war because of drought and because of people's economic hardship caused by the farming, uh, the failure of farms and the failure of rural uh, agriculture in Syria adding to the desperation of the rebellion. And so there is seemingly an intricate relationship between the damage we do in the environment and the spillover of that even into war. Something that we have to become conscious of. But beyond that as well, the oil prices now in the world have dropped, which has deprived some of those regimes with their, from their uh, income levels sure they're not very too badly in some of the less populated oil states, but some of the more populated oil states like Iraq and Iran, because of also the boycott, have had political repercussions coming from a declining economy. So uh, it's beneficial probably in the world sense that we have renewable energy to, to lessen these war-type involvements. At the same time, though, these income levels are going to go down in some of these places. Corruption, of course, is, as, as I say, a serious problem. But that filters down to the average person in most countries as well. What is Mexico going to do if the oil, uh, if the oil uh, market collapses? Mexico is a major oil producer. The United States is a, a major buyer, plus Nigeria. And yet, these resources are some of the reasons some of these insurgencies go on, because the crooks want to control the oil. And some of the political rebels want to control the oil for being able to buy arms, just as they control diamonds and uh, other resources in Liberia for in those awful civil wars. So there is a complicated relationship between these resources and warfare. It'd be better, of course, if, if the world had less push into these places by the militaries. And that would happen if there was more renewable energy. I have a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, 
Kurds because they have elections going on. The Kurdish party will uh, gain a great gain in the last election. The president of Turkey is worried that he lost in the election. He wants to reschedule new elections. And lo and behold, they're fighting with the Kurds. So some of this relates to domestic politics. And there is some element, of course, that anything of where Barack Obama does will be immediately opposed by a significant uh, segment of the Congress. Well, that's definitely true of the public. But what about Democrats who are? Well, Democrats are, and others were, of course, interested in the security of Israel. And the leader of Israel has taken a very strong stand on this question. Some in Israel feel he lost in this. Others say no, he won because he made it an issue. The relationship between Israel and Iran is complicated. Um, not many Americans realize that Israel once supplied the revolutionary Iranian government with arms. You realize that? And when might that have been? Well, it was when Iran was fighting Iraq, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, in the 1980s. And the Iranians were desperate to resupply their American equipment has been given so much American aid. Where are you going to get that when the U.S. is now boycotting Iran because of the hostage crisis? Well, it turns out the place they, they turned, turned to, and despite calling them every name in the book, great Satan's, took arms from Israel to fight Iran. And why would Israel supply Iran? Well, there's an old saying in the Middle East, my enemy's enemy is my friend, at least for a period, at least for now. And so if Israel's main opponent at that time was Iraq, it was thought to be Arab states, Iraq being one of the leaders. Iran is not an Arab state, Persian. Iran and Israel actually had close relations in the past when the Shah was the ruler. So Israel didn't supply Iran at that time. Now, the, the world has turned, the world has turned, so to speak, and Iran is a great threat now, at least played in, into by the Israeli government, because leaders in Iran have made statements that Israel shouldn't exist or shouldn't have existed. And very few in the Middle East will put Israel on the map. So this actually feeds into insecurity in that country. They don't accept it. Same way the Israelis don't supposed to accept the Palestinians. On both sides, oddly enough, see the same the others in the same light. They don't accept us. They don't accept our legitimacy. So Iran is seen as a spearhead, and the sense is if Iran got nuclear weapons, it would be a threat to the security of Israel, even though Israel has nuclear weapons. Don't admit that has them, but they have. There is a split opinion in Israel about this agreement. Many of Israeli, Israel's security community leaders back the agreement. They see it as the best way that Israel can know what Iran is actually doing. Because there will be inspection. Others, however, the main government leaders have been vehement about rejecting the idea that you can trust Iran. And the, when you ask why the U.S. Congress has been uh, um, receptive, it, it, it varies. Some in the far right religious community value the Israelis as, as caretakers of the Holy Land. It's an irony because the religious right in the U.S. has been noted for pastoring anti Semitic. But there is this sort of strange affinity between far right Christian. Christian fundamentalists and Israelis, or the Jewish state, as somehow a caretaker for the problem, for the, uh, the Holy Land. Others, of course, make political hate about Obama. And then the Democrats are sometimes in districts where Jewish vote matters. And maybe New York, or maybe Detroit, or maybe in certain places. So you have, and the Jewish community itself is divided. Most polls show that over 50% of American Jews favor the agreement with Iran. But there are definite, strong voices and influential community leaders and, and agencies who oppose it. So it is a political 
football, as we say. Political football to be used. I guess for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs>